you have a 28 year old lady presenting with history of urinary leak on coughing how are you going to evaluate her I'll see this patient in a dedicated functional urology clinic with a urology nurse specialist present um, and I'll ask them to uh, prior to the appointment to complete an ICIQ short form questionnaire and three day bladder diary and also to arrive with a full bladder to provide your analysis and the residual bladder volume measurement. Um, I'll take a focus history to identify if the incontinence is triggered by urgency, stress, if it's mixed or if it's constant and pointing towards an overflow incontinence. Um, I'll ask about red flag symptoms, um, including a UTI, hematuria, back pain and knee bowel symptoms. Um, I'll ask about the number of daily incontinence episodes, pad usage and the effect on her quality of life. Um, I'll establish her past medical history, um, including any previous pelvic surgery or radiotherapy, and also any previous childbirths and the mode of delivery. Um, I'll establish her med um, medication history, um, and I'll also establish her tobacco usage and fluid intake. Um, I'll perform a chaperone physical examination, uh, measuring the BMI clinic. Um, I'll elicit any abdominal or loin pain, tenderness or powerful masses. Um, and then with the patient's verbal consent, um, I will um, place her into the left lateral position and perform uh, an internal examination of the vagina and perineum using a sim speculum where I'll be looking to assess vaginal estrogenization, uh, the presence of any pelvic organ prolapse, urethral diverticulum or fistulae, um, and also the uh, peripheral neurological status. Okay, uh, predominant symptoms are just urine leak on say climbing up the stairs or laughing or coughing, otherwise she has no other overactive bladder symptoms. Examination wise, she is quite thin and uh, uh, ex you are able to demonstrate uh, urine leak on coughing during the speculum examination. So what further things you can do? Um, so in the clinic, um, I would measure the urine dipstick analysis and measure the uh, residual bladder volume and also analyze the results of her questionnaires. Okay, her questionnaire shows that she's quite symptomatic and uh, her post war residual volume is uh, 10 ml, urine dipstick is normal. Um, so I will um, first of all um, counsel about conservative um, and lifestyle measures um, to, in and to include modifying her fluid intake if necessary. Um, if she has a BMI below 25, she would not need to lose any weight. Um, but I will um, counsel her with regards to pelvic floor muscle training. Um, and in order to do this, I will refer her to a pelvic floor physiotherapist so that she carries out the exercises for at least three months um, and then is reviewed back in clinic in four months. So what is the role of BMI in this pathology? Um, so if there is a high BMI, um, this um, increase, this puts a um, increase on the intra-abdominal pressure um, so that when the patient um, coughs, sneezes or exerts himself, um, this pressure overcomes uh, the urethral pressure that normally inhibits uh, leaking. Okay. Um, this patient, as I said, uh, there is no concerns with her BMI. Any other factors and how are you going to take this patient forward? She attends your clinic after doing pelvic floor exercises in six weeks time. She says only marginal improvement. She's following all the lifestyle changes which you have advised. Um, I will advise that it's reassuring there's been some improvement. Um, I will advise her that she should continue these for at least another six weeks and up to a minimum of three months um, before um, demonstrable benefit can be seen. Okay, you are reviewing her in six weeks time. She has the same minimal improvement. There is no further improvement compared to the first six weeks. She wishes to have something more to be done. Um, I'll counsel about the next steps in management. Um, the second line therapy, um, according to the 2019 NICE guidelines, includes duloxetine. Um, so I will counsel her about uh, this medication um, and I'll talk to her about the side effects, including um, nausea and vomiting, uh, drowsiness and somnolence. Um, if 
she is not keen on this, then I will advise her that the next step in management would be surgical treatments. Um, but in my practice, I'd want to uh, carry out uh, neurodynamic studies um, prior to such an intervention. Okay. And um, why do you want to do neurodynamics? What is the evidence behind this? Um, so, although the um, NICE guidelines do not advise um, neurodynamics prior to primary um, stress incontinence surgery, um, in my practice, I um, would want to rule out uh, the choose overactivity as a cause of her incontinence um, because this would then have an impact in terms of potential post operative complications um, and ongoing leakage despite um, surgery being carried out. If she has detritus or overactivity, do you expect any other coexisting symptoms other than the pure stress urinary leak? Um, one would also expect there to be um, urgency, um, frequency, and urge incontinence. Okay, but uh, she's presented only with uh, stress urinary incontinence. Okay, your urodynamics shows that our filling phase is absolutely quiet. There is no signs of any detritus or hypercontractility or overactivity. She leaks whenever she coughs. Her voiding pattern is acceptable. She voids completely with the bladder emptying. What is your next step? I'll discuss this patient at a local MDT. Um, and this will be to discuss the role of surgical management. Um, and the options would in, to be offered to her would include um, autologous fascial sling insertion, Virtual suspension um, or intraurethral bulking agents. Um, is there any way you can choose between these three options? Um, so this could be also depending on um, the type of um, stress urinary incontinence, um, a classification, and also whether it's due to intrinsic sphincter deficiency or bladder neck or urethral hypermobility. Uh, the way to determine this would be through performing uh, video urodynamics to obtain a blade mass. Uh, classification. So how video urodynamics help you in differentiating these two conditions? Um, so with video urodynamics, um, a um, cystogram is obtained, um, which um, will then um, help to determine the level of the blood neck and urethra relative to the inferior border of the pubic symphysis. Um, grade zero, um, so between grade, grade one is the descent of the bladder base less than two centimeters below the inferior border of the pubic symphysis um, and this would be more in keeping with an intrinsic sphincter deficiency um, grade two is the center of more than two centimeters uh, grade three is um, when there is maximal is when the bladder neck and urethra are already open um, and sorry that would be more intrinsic sphincter deficiency um, below zero and one is more hypermobility okay so if your finding is a hypermobility what is your choice of treatment um so this would be um the choice of treatment there would be a birch copper suspension okay how will you counsel her um i'll counsel her with the aid of a bouse procedure specific uh, patient information leaflet um, outlining the benefits in terms of um, treating her stress incontinence um, the how the procedure is performed with mobilization of the bladder um, and um, sutures to uh, suspend it into a higher position in the pelvis. Um, and I'll outline the um, complications with specific ones, um, including um, failure of the procedure, voiding dysfunction, um, middle or posterior compartment prolapse, um, UTI, um, retention needing ISC, um, and also de novo urgency. What do you mean by middle component prolapse? Um, so this would be, um, I think, u uterine prolapse or posterior compartment prolapse would be also a rectus seal. Okay. What sutures you will tie? What suture material you will use? Um, so I will use a um, 3 O PDS, which is um, an absorbable suture but lo longer acting. Okay, so what structures you will suture? Um, so I'll suture the bladder wall. Um, I can't recall the other structures to su uh, suture to. Okay, we'll come back to that. In case if your 
urodynamic findings are suggestive of uh, intrinsic sphincter deficiency. What is your choice of surgery? Um, so this would be an autologous fascial sling. Okay, we'll have one more question. So what uh, what types of slings you will choose? Why are you not selecting the usual TVT, TOT? Um, so my choice will be a graft harvested from the uh, rectus fascia measuring 10 by 2 centimeters. Um, I'll avoid the um, synthetic mesh um, because there's currently a pause on the use of these in the NHS due to the findings um, of the Cumberland report and the high, um, incidence of uh, mesh complications. Okay, any other sources of autologous fascia harvesting? Um, I think from the fascia lata. Um, but. Okay, uh, one more question to finish. Uh, what is your indications for bulkamed or injection therapy? Um, so according to the NICE guidelines from 2019, uh, these would be where uh, the patient um, is not suitable for um, more extensive surgical management um, or um, is not willing um, to have um, the, the other procedures performed uh, and it may be reserved for patients who uh, may be too elderly, too frail to undergo general anaesthetic. Good. Yeah, elderly is a good choice because elderly patients, again, colpo suspension or uh, autologous uh, fascia surgery, everything is more complex for them. While this will give them a nice uh, temporary relief and even if it gives relief for them, say, for two years, then they can have a repeat uh, injection therapy also. So sometimes you may have to get a little bit more about this injection therapy, how it is injected, what is the material, etc. Yeah. Um, second scenario, much, much better, but as usual, very straightforward scenario. Again, uh, you are mentioning ICIQ short form. ICIQ short form is a bit of a very generic term, so try to specifically mention ICIQ OAB, ICIQ uh, incontinence form, ICIQ male okay. LUTS, so try to s uh, expand it further to say which ICIQ, because there are at least five to seven ICIQ short yeah. forms available now. Um, again, the controversial topics, the same discussion like how we discussed in the first scenario, NICE guideline says there is no need for stationary incontinence in pure, sorry, no need for urodynamics in pure stationary incontinence. But in my practice, I prefer to do that because number one, it will help me to differentiate the intrinsic sphincter deficiency and hypermobility, which is a good yeah. point. That's so, yeah. so then in that, I mean, again, it's not specified NICE guidelines, but then for stress incontinence, You'd be looking at video urodynamics, wouldn't you? Yes. You need that histogram. Yes. Instead of uh, histogram, it's a and video is not a very big addition. Most of the units will have a kind of a CM in situ, and yeah. uh, only the voiding phase. You are just going to screen it to document it in video. So if you are substantiating your practice, which is slightly different from nice guidelines, you need to really bring a strong point in that. So the points to support doing urodynamics are, number one, in my unit we have video urodynamics, so we prefer to do them as a part of uh, preparation for the surgery, which help us to differentiate between intrinsic sphincter deficiency and hypermobility, which also have impact in choice of surgery. And uh, number two, we have a strong MDT, and while presenting the MDT, this will help me to produce a nice uh, substantial evidence for her surgery. And number three, in the previous era, when we are subjecting to the patient to the uh, artificial slings, it's very important to document this finding because of the complexity associated with TVT and TVOT. But in my practice, I've stopped it now, and we are doing only autologous fascia. So all the more reason you have good practical clinical support to do urodynamics. But you can say the NICE guidelines, according to the NICE guidelines, if the patient has symptomatic pure stationary incontinence, usually the urodynamics won't add anything because we expect the detrusor to be good. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Correct.